you may have heard this story before. A great grandmother named Doris donated her body to science. Her family believed her cadaver would be used to aid in Alzheimer's research, but she was actually used to test explosives instead. This story has made its rounds on the internet for years now, and every once in a while it pops back up, reminding about those that might take advantage of a grieving family. However, you may not know the story beneath the headline. Jim Stauffer, Doris's son, did read the fine print carefully. The Biological Resource Center, the organization that brokered her body along with many others for research, had required Jim to sign an authorization form. On that paperwork, he checked a box that prohibits military, traffic safety, and other non-medical experiments to be performed on his mother's body. This isn't just a story of a woman's body being used to test explosives without her family's knowledge. This is a story of her body being used to test explosives with her family's explicit refusal. And while both scenarios are disturbing, only the latter gives the Stoffers any type of legal recourse. But how can this happen, you might ask? Why didn't the army, the ones that performed the tests of Doris, ensure that they had the family's permission? Well, that's the catch. The army said that they never received any consent forms from the BRC. Instead, officials, quote, relied on assurances from BRC that families had agreed to let the bodies be used in such experiments. And that's right. They simply took the BRC at their word. This is especially gross when you learn that the army policies require next of kin to consent to blast experiments. It seems like they don't take their own rules all that seriously, as at least 34 cadavers were shipped to and accepted by the army without family permission. In 18 instances, consent forms neglected to mention the possibility of explosive testing. In 12 more, families checked a box rejecting the violent experiments just as Jim had done. And in four more, no box allowing or rejecting the testing was checked at all. Surely some organizations wanted those consent forms though, right? They have to exist for some reason. Not everyone blindly trusts the BRC, right? Well, here's the second catch. The BRC would change consent forms post-mortem. BRC records indicate that this happened at least twice, but they said it happened with the widow's consent. One of these widows, an elderly woman named Donna Patrick, explained that yes, she agreed to uncheck the box once the BRC contacted her. However, as she explained to Reuters, this was less than two days after her husband passed away. So in her grief, she didn't fully grasp what she had agreed to do. She was quote, at a time when you are susceptible to anything just to get it out of your mind, I didn't know what to do. These disturbing revelations beg a couple of important questions. Who the hell is regulating this industry? And what can happen when you donate your body to science? Hello, and welcome to Dark Dives. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about the body trade in the United States. Now, before we get started, I want to make two important disclaimers. First, we're going to be focusing on the dark side of this trade and the bad actors within it. This does not necessarily represent the industry as a whole. Two, today's episode will heavily discuss the mistreatment of dead bodies to varying degrees. If you're not in the headspace to hear about that, then please click away because this entire episode will be upsetting. Thank you. Before we get too far into this subject, here's a breakdown of how this generally works. The body broker is the middleman between funerals, hospices, hospitals, and clients that desperately need bodies for research, such as a medical company, a medical school, a lab, or whatever it may be. They tell donors that if they use their services, they'll cremate the body for free. Once a consent form is signed and a medical check performed, the body broker may dissect the corpse, depending on what their client's needs are. A client may place an order with a body broker, the broker delivers, and the body parts may be cremated or potentially reused afterwards. Now let's answer one of our questions. Who exactly regulates the body broker industry? The answer, practically no one. Organ transplantation is heavily monitored and regulated by US law. But as of Reuters investigations in 2016, no federal law regulates body brokers whatsoever. Then they wrote that only a single state even keeps records of the inner workings of the industry, which is New York, and their data indicates that in just three years from 2011 to 2014, they shipped at least 100,000 body parts across the country. 
Naturally, I can understand why organ transplantation would need serious monitoring as it affects a living person and could result in death without careful consideration. Still, the idea that there are no real laws governing body brokers is baffling to me. The industry has grown, clearly, and sometimes the people using these services, such as Tina Johnson, who gave her husband's body to the BRC in 2012, have done it purely for the free cremation. On the outside, families may see it as a good thing. They benefit the medical community, which needs bodies to study, and they don't have to go through the headache and cost of a funeral or cremation. We've spoken about this in my episode on the funeral industry. In these moments of grief, taking the time to do research can be difficult and overwhelming, which makes it all too easy for bad faith actors to step in and take advantage. See, while Tina or Jim may have thought they were donating their family member's body, the BRC saw their loved ones as a paycheck. It's no wonder they sold corpses to the army without permission. They charged about $6,000 per body for doing so. But though there are some shady practices within the industry, at least there's some barrier to entry, right? Well, also no. As Reuters put it, almost anyone can dissect and sell the dead. If you hear about selling corpses for $6,000 each and it sounds appealing to you, then you can go right ahead and become a body broker and start profiting off the sale of corpses, often corpses of people living in poverty because their loved ones couldn't afford any alternative, though more on that later. Pretty much all you'll need are some freezers, a cargo van, and a chainsaw. And that's the grim reality. While brokers who care will pay the extra money for surgical saws, an X-ray machine to scan for surgical implants and millions on medical equipment to do the job properly, other brokers half-ass it and spend less than $100,000 on their initial startup costs. Shreves, one of the brokers who actually cares and spent about $2 million in quality control procedures and medical equipment in 2009, said that he's grown to dislike the business because of these types of shady brokers. Anatomy and structural biology professor Todd Olson, who's seen the industry in a different light, even claims that, quote, Nobody is watching. We regulate heads of lettuce in this country more than we regulate heads of bodies. And look, I understand that medical schools and labs do absolutely need bodies. These brokers have a critically important role in medicine. Even Reuters admits that in their extensive articles on the body trade, but it's disturbing how damn easy it is to do this job without a shred of oversight and how there are brokers out there who would treat the dead so casually and with so much disrespect. Like I remember in college, I took an anatomy course that featured a live dissection and of a human and I had to attend it throughout the entire semester. And I remember how much respect and importance it was to treat this now passed away individual with the dignity that they still deserved in their living life. And to then find out that the industry that distributes these bodies treats them with such disrespect is pretty horrific, honestly. Apparently, Reuters was actually able to buy a spine and two human heads from a broker after just a few email exchanges, just to let you know how easy and un, I don't know, un, disrespectful, unhuman this all is. Just, just a couple emails and you can go get yourself some human heads and a human spine, apparently. Now, they've got other questionable clients too. Larry Pahorely has a lab in a suburban Denver office park where he and his daughter dissect the dead. They say it's an art form and a thrill. They do have a genuine lab from what I've been able to find, one that may require cadavers for their research, but when you call it a thrill and refer to the lab as a chamber of horrors, I'm really going to wonder what the hell these clients are actually using these bodies for. Again, it's not appropriate language to use here. Clearly, these brokers aren't really paying all that much attention to where bodies are going, but many of them are certainly paying attention to their wallets. Reuters found that 25 out of the 34 body brokers they located were for profits and the rest were non-profits. One of these for profit brokers apparently earned more than $4 million a year. But again, because most of the country doesn't really keep track of this trade, we don't even really know how many bodies or body parts this for profit broker handled. Because of the serious lack of regulation here, brokers can, at times, practically get away with anything. Back in 2015, tenants near a Southern Nevada warehouse complained about a disgusting stench and bloody boxes by their homes. When health inspectors went to check things out, they found a man in medical scrubs thawing a frozen human torso with a garden hose in the midday sun. 
One report claimed, quote, bits of tissue and blood were washed into the gutters. The steam from the man's hose pooled in front of a technical school across the street. And the man's punishment? Well, it was just a small fine for pollution. Now that sure doesn't seem like enough, but this is the consequence when there are so few regulations in place. In a rush to sell bodies, what you would think are the most basic of health checks are also conveniently overlooked. Reuters looked at Arizona state investigation summaries and found that the Biological Resource Center sent infected body parts all over the country. Apparently in April, 2012, the BRC removed an elderly woman's brain and mailed it to the Harvard Brain Tissue Resource Center all on the same day she died. Three days later, after their industry standard blood sample came back, they were notified that the woman had hepatitis C. Though they notified the family, BRC never actually told Harvard. BRC was informed that her body would be unsafe to use, but didn't think, hey, maybe we should tell the researchers currently in possession of her brain that she had hepatitis C. Like, I understand that giving researchers a body or brain as soon as possible and shortly after death is important, but ensuring safety and quality standards should be just as important. And this is essentially par for the course for BRC. Their founder, whose name fittingly is Gore, said that he did try to do the right thing despite the lack of regulators. However, at times when he was overwhelmed, he quote, often did not. He failed to do the right thing for about a decade after receiving his education about the body trade on the internet in 2004. When he was finally caught, it was only because a Detroit-based body broker was found trying to cross the border into Canada with multiple severed heads, one of which was traced back to the BRC. A former intern at BRC, Emily Glynn, had this to say in her senior thesis. Over the course of the internship, I stripped subcutaneous fat from the vertebrae of a cervical spine, practice performing cryothyrotomies or incisions to the throat, sutured dismembered legs using an oversized needle and twine and decapitated an elderly woman with what looked and sounded like a chainsaw from Home Depot. Not once did I receive formal training or instruction. Gore was convicted in 2015 and served just four years of probation four years of probation for stuffing bodies into freezers, for treating the dead with the utmost disrespect and for misleading widows and grieving family members. Those that had worked with the BRC before, like Jim Stauffer, sued him. He and 10 other plaintiffs in this case were awarded $58 million split between them. It doesn't really feel like justice when they've had to suffer this trauma. And when there are those who that to this day don't even know if the ashes they received are really of their family member. I guess the message here is that body brokers aren't allowed to mislead customers, but they can do whatever the hell they want to the dead with little regard to the fact that they were a person with a family and friends that all cared about them. But it's not just the BRC either, even if they're one of the most notorious examples. The Detroit broker, Arthur Rathburn, leased body parts for medical and dental training. He had over 100 parts within his inventory infected with hepatitis, HIV, sepsis, meningitis, MRSA, and necroticizing fasciitis, which is a flesh-eating disease. Reuters reported that Rathburn's lawyer said his client committed no crime and the government couldn't prove their charges. Apparently, the investigation into him really began when he tried to, and I quote, ship 15 severed human heads in plastic ice coolers on a Delta cargo flight dripping blood. I was curious to know more about Rathburn and it's a morbid curiosity. And as it turns out, Reuters has an abundance of information on him too. After their 2016 article focusing on Doris and the army, they released a seven part series about the body trade. Rathburn is the focus of part four and it is as the title suggests, an absolute horror story. I cannot begin to put into words how much I loathe those that commit the vile acts within this industry, but Rathburn is simply one of the worst. After reading this article, I do question his humanity. Any graphic descriptions thus far pale in comparison to the disturbing nature of what he's done. So allow me to summarize because I promise you do not want all the details. In the mid 2000s, he was reprimanded twice for not being able to prove that the bodies he had were willingly donated. And that's terrifying enough. He racked up five reported cross-border shipments in three years, a variety of severed body parts with him each time. 
He'd store remains by simply stacking them on top of one another with no protective barrier. And he'd throw severed heads in buckets. Arms, legs, and other extremities would have no identification. One FBI agent said in an affidavit that one torso had a different head sewn on it, quote, like Frankenstein. I know this is extremely graphic and disturbing and very upsetting, but I think it's important to bring awareness to how horrible this can get. I truly had no idea what the body trade really was until I started to actively look into it. I saw that viral story about an elderly woman being used to test explosives. And I wondered how could that have actually happened? But once you dig into this industry and see the depths of the depravity, I mean, for fuck's sake, Rathburn is an absolute monster for what he did. I'm not often at a loss for words, but describing him, I'm not sure what else there is to say. Now, not every body broker may be this way, but the fact that ones like Rathburn have been allowed to exist for so long is what churns my stomach. However, there's another aspect to this that I also want to touch base on, hotels. And no, I'm not talking about the urban legend of kidney harvesting. This is proven, this is real, and this is arguably much worse. You wouldn't be surprised if a donor's body ends up in a hospital or lab. That seems like a natural place for a cadaver meant for scientific research. Naturally, if an infected corpse does end up there, hopefully the infection could be contained, right? But what about hotels? Disney, Hyatt, the Sheridan, all of them have had seminars with cadavers taking place in their ballrooms, basements, and other areas of their buildings. When you consider that infected corpses are being dissected in these hotels, it adds a whole new problematic layer to things. Back in 2011, one of the corpses dissected at a Hyatt Hotel in Cambridge, Massachusetts had hepatitis B. That corpse was provided by none other than Rathburn. Thankfully, no one at the conference reported getting sick, and this is why vaccines exist, so you don't actually catch these illnesses. What's especially concerning about this though, is that even if hotels do take a look at their policies, clean up thoroughly and follow proper protocols, when you have people dissecting an infected corpse in your hotel, it's truly asking for trouble. The president of Bioskills Solutions even admitted that these hotel seminars aren't exactly the most sanitary of places stating, when they cut away the knee, there are bone pieces flying. So you cover up the walls. Even if you're trying your very best to prevent cross-contamination, it sure as hell doesn't sound easy. Osterholm, an infectious disease research specialist, says that even if no major outbreak has happened from a dead body thus far, he's absolutely convinced it's just a matter of time. Don't get me wrong, dead bodies are more often than not safe to handle. Caitlin Dowdy, a well-known mortician, including on the YouTube channel, Ask a Mortician, discusses this in a whole video on her channel. And I've talked about this when discussing the funeral industry too. But the key word here is almost always. There are always some risks involved when we're talking about things like HIV. There are guidelines in place on how to handle these bodies. We've mentioned blood being tested for infectious diseases and things of that nature. And these procedures are meant to eliminate that low risk completely. However, if these procedures are not being followed, then yes, shit can happen. But we've only discussed two aspects of this industry, the families and the brokers. Families may be living in poverty and they can't afford a cremation. They feel as if they have no other option and may believe they're doing a good deed. Brokers have next to no regulation whatsoever, allowing bad faith actors to operate in the dark for extended periods of time. But what about the people receiving these bodies? What happens then? Now. That section we just covered was really a lot. It was it was a lot to take in. It was a lot to research. It was a lot to really sit down and have to contemplate what was actually happening. And then to, of course, rewrite it into a more palatable language to present it today. I'm gonna take a quick moment to place today's sponsor here, which is thankfully a Casper episode. Please use the next two to three minutes to you know, clear out your brain because we're gonna jump right back into it. It does not get any better. This is a really serious and dark episode. So I'm trying to use this as a moment just even to take a breather and then we're getting right back into it. So with that being said, here's Casper. Casper smells some good deals in these waters and he's found one, Mint Mobile. This spooky season, Casper wants lots of treats, not only bones, but savings, high-speed data and unlimited minutes. Luckily for him, that's exactly what Mint Mobile offers 
all treats and no tricks for just 15 bucks a month. One of Casper's favorite treats offered by Mint Mobile is how easy they make switching. When you switch to Mint Mobile, you can keep everything, your phone number and even your phone. Or if you want a new phone, Mint Mobile's got your back there too. They have the most popular cell phone brands on the market for delicious deals. Casper can't wait to gobble these up, but there's plenty to go around. And Casper is always sniffing out the best deals for the best cell phone service. Maybe you're not sure how to transfer your information. Well, Mint Mobile's got you there too. And they have a handy guide on where to find your phone plan's information. But what about the tricks? With treats this delicious, where's the catch? Well, that's kind of the best part. There isn't one. Mint Mobile isn't going to scare you with hidden fees this Halloween or put a spell on you, trapping you into a difficult contract. I've definitely had that curse on me before when I was using one of Mint Mobile's competitors. I tried to cancel my service. I was paying something like 90-ish dollars a month, which was just way too much for me. And I wanted to explore my options. So I signed all of their cancellation forms and I was ready to move on. But instead of, you know, canceling my service like I asked for, they sent me to collections, which I then had to fight and then get that removed too. It was an extremely frustrating and headache inducing process to put it mildly, but this doesn't happen with Mint. You pay for what you want and don't pay for any filler. And I've had great experiences with Mint Mobile's customer service too. So enjoy high-speed data and unlimited talk and text with peace of mind, knowing that you're not about to see anything terrifying on your phone bill. For only $15, you get all the best goodies from Mint Mobile's fast, reliable coverage. Now, Casper is passing on the treats and savings to you and your family. Whether you're buying for yourself or the whole family, Mint Mobile is going to give you the best rate. But don't worry, you don't have to come knocking on his doggy door to come get them. You can get premium wireless from just 15 bucks a month and no unexpected plot twists at mintmobile.com slash casket. That's mintmobile.com slash casket. Seriously, you'll make your wallet and Casper very happy at mintmobile.com slash casket. New Yorkers, did any of you do a little silent cheer kind of at the beginning of the episode when I said that your state was one of the only ones bothering to keep records of what happens to cadavers? Well, you can go ahead and walk back that applause now because a New York Times investigation into the way NYU handles corpses reveals another upsetting piece to this puzzle. Even the people receiving these bodies treat them horribly. According to their article, the New York University School of Medicine often promises to cremate and dispose of bodies in a quote, appropriate and dignified manner. While you, me, and the millionaires, opera singers, and costume designers that donated their bodies to NYU may have a similar view on what that means, NYU interpreted this manner as dump them all in a mass grave and call it a day. Hart Island, where these mass graves were located, accepted anyone and everyone, even those that donated to the school. Maria Muscarnera had given NYU almost $700,000 when she died. And she said that before she passed, she wished for NYU to cremate and spread or bury her remains in a dignified manner. The school took this to mean that they should have a city morgue bury her in Hart Island. As there's a prison on the island, the inmates were also paid 50 cents an hour to bury her, which is certainly cheaper than the $155 the school would have had to pay to respect her wishes. It seems that even after about a $700,000 donation, they couldn't afford less than $200 to properly cremate her. Miss Greener, a spokesperson for NYU, said that the school had no idea this was happening and that savings had nothing to do with the case. However, considering her complete and utter failure to explain their reasoning, it's pretty understandable why most people are going to assume the school was just trying to save a quick buck. Like, if there's another excuse you've got, I'm willing to hear it. Until then, there's really no good reason as to why this happened at all. Todd Olson, former director at the Anatomical Donation Program at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, told the New York Times, quote, "'This is so out of line with common practice. The idea of it is so disrespectful. Every time you turn around, you're going to find some people who are taking advantage of their access to the dead because they know the dead are not going to talk.'" Could Maria's case simply have just been an accident? 
Is NYU an outlier in the way medical schools treat the dead? It's possible that these cases aren't commonplace as Olson suggests, but the trouble again is the lack of regulation, transparency, and recourse. Talking about death can be difficult, but when your school is receiving around 46 cadavers per year, it's especially important that each one is taken care of. These schools need donors, so the least they can do is respect the donor's wishes and give them that dignity they're asking for and make it painfully aware to everyone at the school why it's crucial to do this. Brandy Schmidt, an officer of the American Association of Clinical Anatomists, says that strong policies and procedures shouldn't just be put in place, but they shouldn't be a secret either. Doing what you say you will do has to be the cornerstone of your policies, she said. The families, the loved ones, the living donor, in fact, deserve to have a tracking process and an oversight process that equals respect. As for recourse, the dead can't talk. These donors can't tell their stories and their families may not even be aware of what happened to them. George Washington University's medical school lost the identities of about 50 cadavers they used for training. And that means that the families may have been given the wrong ashes. You'd think that these things would be basic, that policies would already exist in place long before it's too late, but apparently not. NYU didn't start putting major changes in place until 2013. And while it's great that change was eventually made, knowing the extent of the damage is almost impossible. And knowing how many other medical schools, hospitals, or labs are in need of these same procedures is difficult to estimate. The sad truth of it all is that medical schools claim they want their students to learn empathy from these cadavers. Some of them, like the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine, even have their students sit down and share a meal across from the cadavers they're going to dissect to see them better as human. It's an important skill for a medical professional to have, empathy. And so then how hypocritical is it for these schools to completely lack the quality that they're trying to teach? Some medical schools are trying to do away with cadavers entirely. Others call it an invaluable experience or a rite of passage. It depends on who you ask. Regardless of how essential you believe them to be, treating them with respect should never be optional. I wanted to end this episode with a powerful and extremely upsetting story told in part two of Reuters series on the body trade. Remember earlier when I said that Reuters was able to buy body parts after only a few emails? These few emails only spoke about billing, shipping, and the question, will the specimens be used for medical research or medical education? It's easy enough to lie, pick one, and have body parts sent straight to your door. And that's exactly what reporter Brian Groh did. He bought two heads and a cervical spine with little effort and was able to identify who the spine belonged to and contact their family. Cody Saunders, born in 1992, grew up with a whole myriad of health issues. He had failing kidneys, a hole in his heart, and went through 66 surgeries and over 1,700 rounds of dialysis before ultimately passing away from a heart attack at only 24 years old. Cody's father, Richard, said that he had no choice but to donate his son's body to Restore Life USA. I couldn't afford nothing else, he told Reuters. Burials and cremations are not cheap after all. Even if Richard didn't want to give his son to restore life, he saw no other option. Besides, they didn't believe that anything egregious would even happen to their son. One paragraph in the Restore Life paperwork reads, I authorize Restore Life USA to obtain all necessary tissue and organs for research and educational purposes. I understand this gift will be used for scientific research, teaching, or other conforming purposes and for use in multiple research or educational venues with for-profit and or non-profit organizations that Restore Life USA in their sole discretion deems necessary to facilitate the gift. Cody's family explained to Reuters that given the wording, they thought tissue samples would be taken from their son. It's not as if Restore Life was clear about dismembering Cody, about selling him to basically whoever asked for a body. The vague wording, in my opinion, absolutely takes advantage of grieving families that just want this process to be over and done with so they can mourn their loved ones in peace. As brutal as it may be to say that donating a body means it's subject to dismemberment, body brokers should be properly disclosing this. Families deserve the transparency. Sometime after this contract was signed, Reuters purchased Cody's spine for $300 from Restore Life. Each of the heads was 300 as well. The organization had sloppy paperwork and a poor medical history, something that Angela MacArthur said wouldn't meet the standards of her university. 
MacArthur, director of the University of Minnesota Medical School's body donation program, also told Reuters that it was deeply upsetting how easily they got their hands on these body parts. She called the body trade the Wild West and added, anyone could have ordered these specimens and had them delivered to their home for whatever purpose they want. As for the heads, Reuters couldn't even identify whose they were because Restore Life didn't include an identification tag. At least they cremated Cody and gave the family his ashes in an attempt to bring them some kind of peace. Cody's parents, when they learned what happened, said they never would have donated his body if they knew how it was going to be dissected. He'd already had so many surgeries in life. Cody's mother, crying, explained to Brian Grow that she didn't want no more surgeries. And his father, Richard, said that he hadn't wanted anyone to cut him in death. Families deserve transparency. Donors deserve regulation. This whole industry is ripe for bad actors, for inhumane brokers. As disturbing as this episode was to make and record and present, I think it's vital to spread awareness that this does exist and that these horrific acts do happen so that we can, maybe one day, really change them. But with all of that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of Dark Dives. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest information. I appreciate you making it through the ending of today's episode. It was a very difficult episode to, again, to create and then present. I'm sure you feel the exact same. If you want to look at more information, including that entire Reuters series on the body trade, it will be linked in my sources below, but I do give you the fairest of fair warnings. It is extremely disturbing. Thank you so much for your time today, and I'll see you in the next one. 